Stoicism can be found all over. Ancient Greek and Roman philosophy seems to be controlled by one person, Ryan Holiday and his Daily Stoic, which has 60 million YouTube views, 1.9 million Instagram followers, and several New York Times bestsellers. This person has TED Talks, Stoicons, Stoic Bros on TikTok, and Stoic Quotes on Instagram. But is Stoicism really as great as people say it is? Like many others, I respect many things about the Stoics and Holiday as well. However, he often gives a simplistic view of Stoicism that reduces it to cliches used in therapy and self-help. Taking it seriously though, is Stoicism wrong in the first place, or does it have some big flaws? Is it a view of the world that makes sense? One of the first things you won't learn from Holiday is that the Stoics, from the Greek philosopher Epictetus to the Roman Stoics like Marcus Aurelius and Seneca, had a philosophy that was based on how people saw the world at the time. That was a long time ago, as we'll see. The Greeks said that to be a Stoic, you had to study ethics, which is kind of what Holiday means, as well as reasoning, physics, and other subjects that deal with nature and the world. Also, the Stoics lived in a world that was very different from ours. Because of this, they may have had some bad ideas that don't always apply to today. They worshipped different gods, believed in personal fate, didn't understand nature as well as we do, and lived pretty violent, brutal, and short lives. The ancients had a lot of wisdom, but they also made a lot of mistakes. Remember this. Let's get started. We will talk about what Stoicism is and how to think about it. We will also look at how it came to be and what life was like in ancient Greece and Rome. Finally, we will talk about what other philosophers like Nietzsche and Hegel said about the Stoics and where its contradictions might lie. Finally, we will ask what it says about our own time in history. What has become known as the dichotomy of control is at the heart of Stoicism and where most people begin their journey. The Greek philosopher Epictetus wrote it in 125 AD in his Enchiridion, which means handbook. Epictetus said that the first task in life, the first job of the philosopher, is to separate things into two pots, what is in our control and what is not in our control. This exercise, which we call the dichotomy of control, is at the heart of Epictetus's lessons. Do I get to decide? Isn't it my job? Our attention should be on what we can control, like ourselves, rather than worried about things that are out of our control, according to Holiday. Some people have called the things Epictetus talks about internals, which are things we can control, and externals, which are things we can't control. In other words, he said, the only things we can control are our own actions, thoughts, pursuits, desires, and aversions. Things outside of our control include our bodies, our property, our image, our commands, and, in a nutshell, anything that is not in our control. For example, he said, I cannot escape death, but I can escape fear of it. In this version, fear of death is an internal force that we can control whether or not we are afraid of it. The problem with this clear line between what we can and can't control is that it gets less clear as we look more closely. We could have control over some things. We can't control some things right now, but someone else could. We could have control over some things if we thought of a way to do it, and we didn't have control over some things in the past but might in the future. One thing Epictetus might say to me is, I don't control how many people will like this video. I only control how hard I work on it. Then I do have some control over how many people like it, which sounds good. If I work at it, learn from my mistakes, and look you in the eyes and into the camera lens with sincerity, maybe more people will remember to like. Or, on second thought, at least don't turn off. That being said, you get the point. I can control a lot of outside factors. This is true for everything. 
You might say that you have no control over the people around you, your health, the media, government decision-making, or nature, but you do. You do this by taking small actions like convincing, fighting, building, and engaging. Everything you look at makes the line between what you can control and what you can't look like it's not there at all. This split comes from the ideas of Zeno of Citium, who was the first Stoic and opened the Stoa school in Athens in 301 BC. Zeno tried to figure out what was really good by looking at things that came from the outside world, like food, wealth, possessions, and things like looks and talents that we're born with and can't change. He saw that all of these things could be used for good or bad, so they couldn't be called categorically and universally good. You can't count on any of them either. They come and go, they're not reliable. The only thing we can control is our reason, our virtue, and our good nature. This is what determines whether things are used or abused. He told us that we shouldn't care about anything else, the outside things. But once more, this clear line of separation gets fuzzy. The problem is that it's hard to say we shouldn't care about things outside of us while also admitting that they are useful. This is because, as much as we'd like not to depend on them, we do. We need food, clothing, relationships, and other things. For this reason, Zeno said we should both not care about them because they are outside of us and beyond our control, and think of them as preferred indifference, which means we should want them if we can. Because of this, there is a problem with the Stoic method. The philosophy can't really value some things more than others because it only labels them as external and says we shouldn't care about them. On a Stoic level, it kills everyone in the world. For the Stoics, that neat line is broken when you recognize a link to something as part of who you are and how you live your life. If we value plants for building, food from nature, friendship for talk, and technology to help, we recognize that the world isn't something separate from us. We're part of it. As I say a lot, we're nature reflecting on itself. We need a way of valuing things, which is where philosophy frequently comes in. Without a value system, we have no basis for acting, choosing, or being king. Also, valuing means attachment. So when we value food, we recognize that we need it, that we're connected to it, and that it's part of us. Value systems link us to the outside world and give us things like hope, need, want, desire, movement, and life. As we will soon see, dividing the world makes us separate from it. The next thing we should think about is why the Stoics wanted to separate themselves from the rest of the world. The tragic history of Rome and the shortness of life. One of the main ideas in Stoicism is that life is tricky, uncertain and short. Everything changes, rises and falls. Things in the world change over time. Seneca said, all things human are short-lived and perishable. Buddhists say that this means we should let go of all desire because it will only lead to sadness. They did allow for some desire though. Seneca said that we should view life's conditions with joy, but what we desire should be very careful. For the most part, we should only desire two things, tranquility, eudaimonia, good spirit, and peace. The first is virtue which for the Stoics means living in accordance with nature. Seneca said that we should always think about the bad things that could happen to us in order to feel calm. He said that people who expect nothing but good fortune are the ones who feel misfortune the most. This means that if we think about or write down the bad things that could happen to us before we begin a task that could be frustrating or go on a journey where we could get stuck in traffic, the misfortune will have less of an impact on us. Epictetus says that while we are taking care of our kids, we should also think about the fact that they might not be alive tomorrow. On the one hand, we should remember that life is rough, painful, and stressful. Every morning, Marcus Aurelius reminded himself that 
The people I deal with today will be meddling, ungrateful, cocky, dishonest, jealous, and surly. And we should remember that death hangs over you. In this case, Seneca, Marcus, and Epictetus were interested in this kind of advice because they were Romans. The world of the ancients was, without a doubt, harsh, uncertain, annoying, and short-lived. Life was unpredictable, dangerous, and short. Nothing was safe. There was a lot of hunger, disease, war, and sadness. Think about Seneca. He was put to death by Emperor Claudius because he was said to have had an affair with his niece. Instead, he chose to send him away and take his things. Seven years later, Claudius's new wife, Agrippina, talked the emperor into sending Seneca back to teach Nero. Seneca gladly agreed and taught the young Nero some intellectual wisdom. He taught him that kindness should be the basis of his rule and that his power should be shared with the lawmakers. Seneca also taught Nero about justice and the Stoic tradition. However, Nero was conceited, angry, and scared, so he tortured, banned, and killed his enemies. He killed two wives. One was very big. He built a special boat to kill his mother, but it sank at sea, saving her life. He then had to send his guards to kill her instead. In plays, he abused Christians and had dogs tear some of them apart. For his part, Seneca stood up for Nero after he killed his mother. Eventually, a plot to get rid of Nero grew. Nineteen senators took part. In response, Nero fought back and told Seneca to kill himself. It is said that the Stoic philosopher cut his wrists and died in the bath. In ancient times, being a philosopher was, in a way, dangerous work. People told Socrates that he had to drink poison to kill himself. All philosophers were sent out of the Roman Empire by Emperor Domitian. Some parts of Rome eventually rose up against Nero, and the plot to kill him grew. He ran away and killed himself outside of Rome's walls. Although Nero's rule wasn't particularly exceptional, he does get a bad rep. Julius Caesar knew that he could not trust anyone in Rome. At different times, kings were killed by their wives, security, friends, co-workers, and slaves. They had a good reason. Senators and aristocrats were abused by Roman emperors. Emperor Gaius laughed out loud at a dinner party and, when asked what was funny, said, Just the thought that I would only have to nod and your throats would be cut on the spot. Domitian invited senators to a dinner party where everything was painted black and the senators' names were carved into tombstone slabs. The emperor made fun of them at dinner by talking about death all the time. After dinner, he sent them home. Friday night wasn't great. In turn, he was killed himself later. Domitian's replacement, Claudius, put 35 senators to death. The Senate was afraid of Caligula, and in the end, senators and guards killed him after many failed plans. It is said that Vespasian started the great fire of 64 AD to clear Rome so that he could build his new house. Each replacement was a mess. Emperors and the Senate are always putting each other's powers to the test. There was a lot of incest, rape, and pedophilia. There were a lot of fires and diseases. It doesn't matter if Nero played while Rome burned. It did burn for five days. Almost a quarter of it was destroyed. In half of Rome's areas, there were only a few houses left standing. Following Spartacus's uprising, 6,000 slaves were put to death along a 120-mile road. Imagine seeing a man in pain on a cross every 30 meters for 120 miles. Imagine having a terrible nightmare while walking for days along a busy road past that. That's one of the cruelest things I've ever heard about in history. Not even the Nazis would have been brave enough to do that. With all of that in mind, it's easy to see why Seneca wanted to tell himself every day how hard and short life was. It might have been helpful for him to put the risks of top Roman man life out of his mind by concentrating on what was within his control. Barry Strauss, a historian, put it this way, Nero knew better than anyone else that Rome was rich. 
but there was nothingness beneath the wealth. People like Seneca and the Stoics thought that inner peace was the answer. The Romans said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Stoicism is not a philosophy of life, it is a philosophy of sadness, the fate gods. One more thing you might not learn from watching someone like Holiday is that for the ancient Greeks, Stoicism was a way of thinking that included studying logic, physics, and ethics. Their ethics, which is the part we talk about most today and looks at how we should act, is based on an ancient Greek view of logic and physics as well. The Stoic system, for example, is so well built, so firmly joined and welded into one, with such close interconnection of the parts, that if you change a single letter, you shake the whole structure, wrote Cicero. Now, the Stoic view of physics was much broader than our modern view. It included the study of nature, religion, the world, and how things worked. Most importantly, and this is what Cicero was getting at, the whole universe, or physics, was set up exactly the way God planned it to be. That means that our morals, or how we should act, are in line with that plan. To live a good and virtuous life, we should act in accordance with nature, said Zeno. In his meditations, Marcus Aurelius says that we shouldn't go against nature's law and that we all fit into nature's scheme. He also says that we shouldn't fight nature and should instead do what nature tells us to do. What does this mean? To live in line with nature, you need to have an idea of what nature is like, how things are put together, or what nature's schema is. And because they were religious, the ancient Stoics had a strong belief in fate. They thought that people should accept what happened to them and that we can't change our fate. They thought that the gods planned our whole lives. They believed in Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos, who were spirits of fate. A lot of people talk about this. It's a great comfort that we are being pulled along with the world, as Seneca put it. Epictetus said that we should want things to happen the way they do. Holiday has a tattoo on his arm that says Amor Fati, which means love of fate. He also sells an Amor Fati coin. He quotes Aurelius as saying, if the inner power that rules us is true to nature, it will always be able to easily adapt to the possibilities and opportunities set by circumstance. In other words, we should bend nature to fit our needs instead of the other way around. We are wrong, we have bad desires, bad reactions and bad judgments and we must focus on our own internal soul rather than the externally ordered God-given world because everything is both out of our control and ordered according to a plan, to fate. In order to live in harmony with nature, Zeno said, we should change ourselves. First, this is a very specific philosophy, and you can see how Stoic ideas influenced early Christianity. For example, the idea of original sin shows how we are born wrong and need to work on ourselves to fix ourselves. All of this, while sounding good, misses the fact that nature and the world are often shaped to fit our wishes, not the other way around. This means that the outside world shapes us just as much as we shape it. We are, after all, a pretty useful species. A dam is a good example. According to the Stoics, a flood is an act of nature, not God, and that if we want to live in harmony with nature, we shouldn't live near a place that could flood. Instead, we should avoid dry land for farming and live near water to fish in. But people also build dams, roads, sea defenses and boats. They control nature, use it, and guide it to serve their needs. We can either spend this moment hoping it could be different, or we can embrace this moment, says philosopher William Irvine in his book on Stoicism. However, this advice could also be taken the other way around. It's the basis of engineering, science, and growth to say, we can either spend this moment resigned to acceptance, or we can fight to change it. Fatalism has fallen out of favor, broadly speaking. We no longer believe in what is called teleology in history, which means that there is a set end to history. 
Modern science has also shown that religious ideas about fate are wrong. Astronomy took the place of astrology. One example of a non-teleological process is evolution, which is just chance selection. It's also very slave-like to think that you should love your fate. Holiday says that you should not only love fate, but also say, this is going to make me better. Find the link above. This is the whatever doesn't kill you will make you stronger motto. It sounds good, but it's clearly not true. Some things hurt us and don't make us stronger. We should fight them, avoid them, or rally against them. Should a slave love what's going to happen or take a stand against their chains? Should women not have fought for the right to vote? Should someone who, say, loses a child, lives through a terrible war, or is forced to work their whole life always say, I am better off for this happening to me? A miserable emperor king, the cries of antiquity. Epictetus was a slave. Seneca was the head of a crazy emperor's empire. But what about the wise man king, the philosopher Marcus Aurelius? As emperor, Aurelius lived through one of the worst times in Roman history. He was sick, his wife had affairs, and gladiators were said to have slept with him at their house by the sea. During his rule, Rome was attacked by the Parthians in the east, which caused a four-year war, then by the Germans in the north, and finally by the Antonine Plague, which killed millions of people from Europe to Asia. Witnesses said the dead were piled up outside of homes, while people inside groaning in pain. The war with the German groups was bad. After one fight, the Germans beat and killed 20,000 Romans. On top of that, in 175 AD, one of Aurelius's generals rose up against him and claimed the throne. Most Eastern Romans were on his side, and some sources even claim that Marcus's own wife joined him. The uprising went on for months. A centurion killed Aurelius just as he was about to march east, which was a good thing. Marcus didn't like his job, admitting that he had trouble managing his anger and didn't like or respect other people very much. On top of that, his son Commodus was, to say the least, a failure. He was killed soon after becoming king. Marcus was attracted to a philosophy that split the world into internal and outward parts, which makes sense. Barry Strauss, a historian, says he could be crude or moody. He made class differences stronger. Christians were persecuted more locally during Marcus's rule, and he must be held partly responsible. Living under the constant threat of betrayal and disease, it's not surprising that Aurelius had to think so deeply about death. Is it any wonder that he advised himself to despise not death, rather smile at its coming? It is among the things that nature wills, as well as to take it that you have died today and your life story is over. And from now on, regard what additional time may be given to you as an uncovenanted surplus and live it out in harmony with nature. As if Aurelius is trying to convince himself of something he really fears, he talks and talks and talks about death and dying all the time, as if the lady is protesting too much. The Roman writer Cassius Dio says, he did not have the good luck that he deserved because he was not physically strong and was involved in many problems for almost the whole of his reign. The philosopher J. A. Mollison puts it this way, if one suffers slavery, as Epictetus did, advises a violent and impulsive emperor, as Seneca did, or faces wars on multiple fronts, as Marcus did, then the invitation to turn away from the external world toward the inner citadel of reason may provide great comfort. Making Nietzsche feel bad. You know what I said at the beginning? Stoicism still seems useful, and there's a lot to respect about it. Friedrich Nietzsche, an uberchad from the 1800s, wrote about Stoicism and showed that it has some important ideas, but also seems to make no sense. Nietzsche draws inspiration from the Stoics in a lot of his writing because he likes the love of fate and admires their ability to be self-sufficient and as resilient to outside forces as possible. We free spirits, 
are the last of the Stoics, he said. He knew where it came from, though. He wrote, Stoicism may well be advisable for those with whom fate improvises, who live in violent times, and who depend on impulsive and dangerous people. Other times, he despises the Stoics, especially their view that emotions and passions are externals, things that happen to us, things we should find against, things that are irrational compared to what's important, living according to peaceful eudaimonic virtue. He wrote, The main goal of Stoic education is to get rid of all things that make people easily excited and to limit the number of things that can affect a person at all. This is done by teaching people to hate and be hostile toward things that make them excited, as if the emotions themselves were a sickness or something ignoble. Close attention to all unpleasant and upsetting signs of suffering. In short, to petrify as a cure for suffering. If you think this way, he says, it underestimates the worth of pain. It is as useful and beneficial as pleasure, the worth of excitement and passion. He also says that he doesn't like how the Stoics prescribed and used indifference and stone column coldness as a cure for the feverish idiocy of the emotions. What used to be called affects, or things that have an effect on you, are your emotions and desires. They come in many forms, such as happiness, excitement, fear, anxiety, anger, love, and zeal. For the most part, the Stoics said that these things are outside of us and happen to us. They also said that our souls are separate from our minds and reasoning. We should not give in to our emotions too much, Instead, we should seek peace. According to Holiday, the Stoics believe that the mind is a spiritual soul and the body, which includes emotions, is irrational, unstable and wildly passionate. However, this doesn't match up with modern research. For example, neuroscientist Antonio Damasio has made the case that emotions are part of cognition, not just part of being human, which they are, they're part of how we reason, how we interact with and understand the world. From a reasonable point of view, our emotions show us the way around the world. For example, quick fear of something turns our attention to something dangerous, hunger to food, laughter to friendship, interests and energy to projects, and so on. What we feel shapes our world. We shouldn't fight them. Instead, we should pay attention to them, use them, and live through them. Holiday, for example, says, Of course, many emotions, like anything else, can be harmful if we feel them too much, if they take over our lives, or if they make us unhappy. But I believe it can send a bad message to say that anxiety is about the person and not about what they went through, the situation, or a disease. Sure, anxiety can be a sign of a real problem, danger, or issue in the world, but sometimes it's just something small and silly. What we think is bad often has a good side to it. It's important to feel. To get through emotions, you shouldn't judge them or push them away. What if pain is necessary for understanding, suffering is necessary for pleasure, anger is necessary for justice, sadness is necessary for dealing with loss, and so on? In short, what if it's important to feel? Nietzsche's Übermensch Zarathustra says, For the Creator to be, there must be a lot of suffering and a lot of change. He goes on to say, The tremendous tension imparted to the intellect by its desire to oppose and counter pain makes him see everything he now beholds in a new light. He cries to himself, Raise yourself above your life as above your suffering. Look down into the deep and unfathomable depth. Several studies support the idea that to live a healthy life, we need to experience all kinds of emotions. Feelings help us figure out what's going on in our lives. One study found that drinkers who tried to hide their feelings and thoughts about drinking had more of them. It was found in another study that people who tried to fight their negative emotions had more of them than people who just let themselves feel upset or anxious. It was found in another study that accepting anxiety was a better way to deal with it. 
they discovered that people who were stressed about a job interview or test did better on the task at hand, while people who were told to cheer up did worse on the task. Pessimists were less likely than optimists to experience sadness after a bad life event, according to another study. There are links to those studies below. There are many parts to our emotions, but they are an important part of our lives, good and bad. Being angry, gloomy or sad isn't a good thing. It's just that we often don't give the reasons we're feeling that way enough credit and don't understand, work through or experience them correctly. It was Nietzsche who said, the passions have been brought into disrepute because of those who were not strong enough to use them. What if, instead of seeing death as something to accept, life as something temporary, emotions as something to get over, and nature as something that just happens to us, we saw ourselves as connected to and having a good relationship with the world and ourselves shaping it. What if we didn't care about anything and limited what we valued? What if we actively valued things and said, yes, I want this, with full faith? We're aware that we're affected by and change the world. What if we don't love fate, we hate it? What if we say, pugna fati, which means fight fate? So you want to live according to nature? Nietzsche wrote in a notebook with a mocking tone. Oh, you good Stoics, this phrase is such a lie. Imagine nature that is wasteful without limits, uncaring without limits, without direction and care, without kindness and justice, both fertile and empty and unclear at the same time. Living, isn't that wanting to be something other than nature? Don't you think that life means judging, favoring, being unfair, being limited, and wanting to be different? The German philosopher Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel also didn't like the Stoics. He also thought it was a part of Roman man's worldview where there were owners and slaves. He said that Stoicism came from the way slaves thought. Since the master is making the slave feel bad, the slave goes to their own thoughts, which are the only real freedom they have and that no one can take away. This makes people doubt everything outside of themselves always saying no to it and moving away to something else. This ends up making people sad because they don't see their link to God and the world. The Stoic slave responds, yes, the world is bad, but my judgments are always free. As a result, the slave constructs a psychological wall of self-defense. But it doesn't explain a very important fact. The world keeps happening to the wall no matter how high or well-built it is. What it wants, needs, feels and knows keeps coming up against the challenges and pressures of the world, pushing it to interact with the world and change the circumstances it finds itself in to move history forward. We make our cases and come up with new things for a reason. The creative individual deliberately seeks to confront and break boundaries to expand the domain of human experience, to overcome limitations hitherto unchallenged, or to vanquish resistance perhaps thought unassailable, writes philosopher Bernard Regenster. Good luck, Pugna. Instead of saying, it's not that this thing that's happened to me is bad, it's only my judgment of it that's bad, put our chips on the table and stating, my judgment of this thing as being bad is true. I'm going to go out on a limb and fight for it, Make the case, this law, this convention, this idea, this poison is bad. When we make a value decision about something, we plan for the future. We consider what kind of lives we want to lead, what we want to design, build or write, what kind of friendships we might want or where we want to go and how we can get there. As Aurelius said, do every act of your life as though it were the very last act of your life. Stoicism suggests living in the present moment as if each could be your last. Once more, this sounds good, but it's not a philosophy that makes sense. There is no reason to do anything without thinking about the bigger picture. What if we lived each day of our lives as if we were going to live forever? Can't this make you feel better about life? 
to live each moment as if it were a part of a bigger picture, planning, working on, and setting long-term goals. Living each day as if it were your last, as if life were short and you could be killed at any time by a Roman emperor or a group of barbarians is absurd. Dreams are all we have. In the middle of a war, historian Henry Gruber talks about Seneca, who sees his property stolen, his daughters enraged by the enemy, and his home city taken over by the enemy. As Gruber says, this is a very scary passage. Seneca says, Amid swords flashing on every side, and the uproar of soldiers bent on pillage, amid flames and blood, and the havoc of the smitten city, amid the crash of temples falling upon their gods, one man alone had peace. Even after everything that has happened, the sage stands unmoved. Do you love me? In other words, don't plan, dream, live, desire, hope, or fight against it. Why use Stoicism? Now, to understand why Stoicism is becoming popular again, we need to look at our own time and how it relates to philosophy. Things like science, government, industry and technology have made modernity possible. But modernity is mostly about one thing, control. Sociologist Max Weber said that science and technology, in particular, have been about disenchantment of nature since the Enlightenment. This means making the world less mysterious so that we can understand it better and gain more control over it. To build tools and structures, we need to understand physics. To control diseases with drugs, we need to understand the elements. To study geology and get rocks, we need to understand the elements. To make plans, to organize transportation networks, and so on. But postmodernism calls this control into question. How much of the world have we really tamed? Capital moves quickly and randomly around the world through stock markets as a result of neoliberalism and digital finance. Around the world, prices and assets are mostly controlled by private companies. Banks act like they are in charge, but the 2008 crash showed that they weren't. Iraq and Afghanistan showed that the US does not have complete control over world events. A outbreak told us that we don't have as much control over disease as we think in a post-truth world where facts are always in question. To get anywhere in the world, we have to hand over control of our lives to experts. Most of the time, we don't know how our phones or planes work, but we trust scientists and experts, even when we don't know much about them. To put it another way, we're faced with even more of those externals, or things outside of our control. Sociologist Zygmunt Bauman says, the dominant sentiment is now the feeling of a new type of uncertainty, not limited to one's own luck and talents, but concerning as well the future shape of the world, the right way of living in it, and the criteria by which to judge the rights and wrongs of the way of living. When we add in falling living standards, income that have stayed the same for decades, rising inequality, and a time of massive technological and social change, we can see why neo-neo-stoicism is so popular. We may not know much about our world and what to expect, just like the Romans did. Too much has changed. But at the same time, the rise of new media has made philosophy and new ideas easier for more people to get than ever before. And since Stoicism was one of the first and easiest ways to think about philosophy, maybe we're seeing the start of a new era in philosophy. People who defend the Stoics will say that they didn't really preach giving up on the world. They were active players, like travelers, school builders, and rulers. That's not my point, though. Of course, giving up on life is not possible, and that conflict is reflected in their philosophy. That doesn't mean you shouldn't read, study, or interact with them. They can teach you things. However, we should keep in mind that Stoicism was a philosophy of hopelessness that was adopted by a group of cruel and squabbling Bronze Age warriors who believed in gods of fate and had no knowledge of science, change, or progress. It was one of humanity's first attempt of philosophy.